controversial Queensland research project, originally titled Laughing at the Disabled, has sparked a bitter worldwide debate over whether it's humour or tasteless exploitation. Hold the disabled in your heart and do not, do not never be seduced into mocking or ridiculing them. A battle over freedom of speech has thrown the Queensland University of Technology into turmoil. Protesters are claiming a culture of fear after two senior lecturers were suspended for criticising a student's work. How do we treat people with disabilities with humanity? is the real issue that took Gary out on this. Now, he's not exploring this notion there's a fine line between being laughed at and laughing with. That is an absolute nonsense. If Michael Noonan was ever laughed at, he would know what the difference laughing is. Laughing at the disabled. If you substitute the word disabled for laughing at lesbians or laughing at the homosexuals or laughing at the Muslims or laughing at the Down syndrome or laughing at any range of people, most of us would be offended. The TV series focuses on two disabled guys Noonan met when he made another TV series called Unlikely Travellers. At first I couldn't believe my eyes and uh, I don't know, I, I was in almost in some kind of shock because uh, just I couldn't believe it. Everyone is going to have their own view about where you cross that line. The reality is that anyone who works in comedy understands implicitly that you will offend people. Set them up in a situation in which they were going to be mocked and ridiculed. We found this highly offensive and, and highly unethical. I've tried, tried very hard to explain to them what's wrong with laughing at the disabled. I've always liked making comedy films. Ever since I was a young age, I remember I used to make these uh, films on my dad's computer paper and I'd make my family sit in my room and watch them. And they were always horrors or, you know, thrillers and people being killed. And I made this one where my entire family was massacred. And it was hilarious and everybody laughed. And I remember that stood out as the best response I'd had to any film. Ever since then, I've always tended towards trying to write stuff that was funny and, and trying to make stuff that, that people will laugh at and will, will engage with and, and, you know, think is, think is, you know, funny. I got a call from John Hart, who was from a community organisation, and he said he wanted me to make a film about disability. My first reaction was, I have no idea about disability. Um, I don't, I've never worked with people with disabilities, I don't interact with them. And, and to be quite honest, I thought it sounds really boring and it's not something I really want to do with my career. I've been in disability, um, working in the disability sector for 16 years and I'd often go to a, a party and someone would say to me, what do you do, you know, as they do, what do you do for a living? I say, I work with people with disabilities and um, they'd always, everyone would always say the same thing, which, which was, uh, oh, you must be a special person or you, uh, these sort of people must be hard to work with and, I, and I, that sort of used to blow me away and of course you'd answer it and say no they're great people they're funny people I, I really enjoy my job but and I thought so I got this so often that I thought we really need to break down um, the views what people have of people with intellectual disability so I thought the best way to do that was probably uh, probably try and get it on film or try and make some sort of a TV show of course not knowing anything about film or filmmaking um, I needed to find a filmmaker And I guess I thought, I don't really know what I can offer to this. So I thought, well, I'll meet with John and, and we'll have a chat. And um, so we met and he talked and he said, no, I don't want, I don't want a film about disability that's going to be um, boring and fluffy and cosy. I want it to be real and I want it to be funny and engaging. And, and so I thought, well, you know, I can do that. I, that's something I can bring. You know, that's, that's, that's an experience I, I, I thought I could offer and I could, I could make a film like that. So long, now we're checking out. The finished product was probably everything that I wanted plus more. It was um, hilariously funny, it was moving, it made people cry. It was a lot more than I ever expected it to be.
We finally finished Unlikely Travellers and I was completely converted. I realised that all my misconceptions about disability had been completely shattered. Um, I got particularly friendly with Darren and James and, and uh, I used to hang out with them and we'd have barbecues and go to the pub and, and, and got on with them really well and really enjoyed their humour and their, their, their characters. And I thought, well, I really want to get them on screen again. I want to make another show with them because they're so good and I just thought they were such a talent and they're so funny and, and people warm to them and are endeared yeah. by them. So uh, I talked to them and they love mysteries and they love travelling and so I thought, well, we should make a show, like a, a series about them travelling around uh, Australia and, and exploring mysteries yeah. and talking to people and interacting. And um, so I thought, well, yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's, let's do some, another show. Welcome, everyone. We're going on a trip to Down Under and we're going to find everything and find out all the things about... Oh, the Yowie UFO and Hang Rock. Yep, Min Min Roy. Down Under. Down under. Have you been to Down Under before? No, I've only been to Sydney. I'd wanted to do my PhD for quite a while and I didn't really have a topic that was worthwhile exploring. I didn't really have anything that, you know, had enough to it that could make something interesting and, and worth spending three years on. And then and, and so then I thought, well, maybe I can, this show with Darren and James, maybe I can integrate this with a PhD and I can, this can be my PhD and I can explore um, the representation of disability in comedy and, and that mix and, and the fine line you have between laughing at and laughing with because I, I, I thought that was really interesting because there are times with Darren and James when you know the line is is a little bit blurred and so I thought well this could be my PhD. Us two we, we're going to find everything out of, yep. of everything. Yeah we're going to find out and we're going to do some research and find out and tell people solve mysteries so people don't have to worry about them anymore. Yeah. So people can just can just move on with their lives and, yep. they can, and just be like continue their lives in peace. And it's going to be fantastic and exciting and exciting. oh yeah, I cannot wait to go. It's going to be really exciting. Yeah. I can remember Michael Noonan ringing me and saying that um, he had an idea, he wanted to do his PhD. And he rang me and he said, I've got the topic, do you want to hear what it is? And I said, yeah, what is it? And he said, it's called Laughing at the Disabled. Let's go! Let's go. When I was 20, 20 years old, I was walking down University Avenue in Belfast. And for some reason, I said out loud to the universe, I will never sell out. I was, kind of, I don't know, I was sober even at the time. <laughs> and um, I said that. And that's my advice to, of course, be careful, be cautious, but do not sell out. Do not betray your hearts. Because your heart is a lonely hunter. Your heart hunts and seeks for transcendence. I mean, the very first lecture I attended in QUT was, was conducted by Dr. Gary McLennan, in, in, in fact. And um, it was a completely different, life-changing, I would say, not really life-changing, but it was definitely a very different class from all the, the previous um, lectures that I've ever attended in my entire life. I love Gary. He's like our hero. And He's the reason I come to uni. It's pretty much the only lecture I turn up to. I'd known Gary McLennan and John Hookham for quite a while. Um, John had been at QUT for 10 years, and Gary, I believe, had been at QUT for you know 30 plus. Um, I'm, a, I'm a teacher at QUT, you know, part-time teacher, so I engage with and talk to students, and they would always, um, you know, quite frequently talk about how great Gary was and how much they loved him. I love Gary to bits. Gary is by far and away the best lecture I've had in my short time at QUT. John and Gary are both great teachers and mentors. Gary has taught for over 32 years at QUT. Gary McLennan saved my life. He taught me the importance of friendship and loyalty after visiting me in jail and leaving me a collection of books. So I had respect for them and I understood them to have you know, wisdom and experience and, and something to offer. As things are, they will not always be. Thank you. When you do a PhD, about a year in, you've got to do what's called a confirmation, which is basically you present your work, you present what you've, what you've researched. Laughing at the disabled, creating comedy that confronts, offends and entertains. 
Uh, it's quite a nerve-wracking experience because it's a, you know, a room full of scholars and academics and other students. And uh, so uh, in my case, we'd shot an episode of Darren and James. So I show some of the footage, discuss you know, where the project's heading. It got a great response. Like Everyone was engaged and people were laughing at the right moments. And uh, I thought, oh, this is going really well and this is going to work. And people seem to be really you know, impressed by the project. <laughs> then it came to question time. And... Basically anyone can ask a question or they can put forward a view about something and uh, there were two academics up the front that I knew, John Hookham and Gary McLennan. And uh, they had very sort of very serious looks on their faces. I remember looking at Gary and he had this scowl on his face, like really nasty scowl and I, I, I didn't quite know what was going on. I have a handicapped child and I pray to God he never comes into contact with someone like you. There wasn't really a question, it was just they both you know, individually came out with this you know, really sort of strong attack on, on the footage and what I was doing. It's profoundly ill-conceived and offensive. You should explore an alternate topic for your PhD. I was very sort of like what's going on because you know where's this coming from I don't I, I just was completely flawed in the sense I just didn't understand what they were seeing or how they were perceiving the footage I just didn't get it Philistines of Relativism at the Gates by John Hookham and Gary McLennan. Time comes when you have to say enough. Last straw. The defining moment came for us in recent PhD confirmation at QUT. Candidate Michael Nunes' thesis laughing at the disabled. This is nothing less than an offence to the human spirit. You know, part of me thought, well, this will blow over. You know, it's their opinion. It's, it was a big article and it was, you know, it was very upsetting, but I thought, no, well, you know, this will go away. On State Line, the movie maker accused of mocking the disabled. Uproar at students' disabled comedy. Degrading reality TV project mocks disabled. A PhD student's TV comedy about disabled people has sparked outrage by a senior academic and prompted an investigation. I got calls from, from radio, from television, from talkback, uh, all wanting me to, to, to talk about this project, this horrible project that was exploiting people with disabilities. A poor piece of junk! As parents of children with autism, we found Gary McLean's descriptions of the scene gut-wrenchingly offensive. Mindless, biblical crap. Cruel and unfunny. It's a disgrace to our society that disadvantaged people can be exploited in the name of humour. Tantamount to cruelty. Bloody outrage! This is cruel beyond belief. A sick joke and not a lie. Stripping people of humanity in this way has a brutal... What a triumph for Australia. You managed to be more ignorant and tasteless than America. There was so much misinformation that had been spread about it that I was this evil person and people were writing blogs, you know, basically condemning me, calling me evil, calling me an exploiter of the disabled, you know, calling for me to become disabled so that I could learn from a closer perspective. Who's laughing now? Is the author Noonan really so stupid as to think disabled people want to laugh at their disabilities? Sick and discriminatory work. Those who are associated with the thesis should never be allowed in any decent society. Noonan is a fool. One can only hope that Noonan becomes comes disabled, so you can see things from a closer personal perspective. If this happened in the US, this student would be arrested on a variety of criminal charges designed to protect individuals with disabilities from abuse, harassment and exploitation. Here I am trying to make a TV show that will change people's misconceptions, that will do great things for people with disabilities. And, you know, the whole world thinks that it's this awful thing. Woeful excuse for academic study. Serious project which deserves not a doctorate, but community condemnation. Yeah, community must have been smoking something toxic. Scrap this puerile and odious parody of genuine scholarship. This is crazy stuff. This is absolutely crazy. People are commenting on things that they haven't even seen. You know, the, the standard comment was, I haven't seen the footage, but... Without seeing the film, I think the basis of it, laughing at the efforts of two disabled young men... I had a quick scan of the article. Appalling material. Well, it's hard to say without seeing the footage for myself. Descriptions of an audience laughing at a man with Asperger's, twitching uncontrollably and unable to answer a question about dating women sounds well exploited. A nastily exploitative form of self-indulgence. I'd have to reserve judgement. My thesis was called Laughing at the Disabled, Creating Comedy that Confronts, Offends and Entertains. And 
People had confused that um, with the actual name of the show. So there was this impression that it was this candid camera type show with me running around with the camera, setting up sketches and throwing these guys with disabilities into situations and seeing what happens. And that's not what the show is. The show is called Darren and James Down Under Mystery Tour. It's always been called that. That's what the TV show is. The thesis is a different thing, and that's the overall sort of exploration that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm seeking to do. And that's what ends up on the bound thesis that ends up in the library and that no one ever, you know, will probably ever read. Only cowards would seek to make or defend a film which by its very title seeks to do little but mock those who cannot defend themselves. What kind of moron, even with the best of intentions, couldn't see the potential harmful message? It seems blindingly obvious to me that more care should have been taken with selecting a better title for the the title of the research project, which one would assume accurately describes its content, demeans and devalues the individual with disability and families with disability. inviting controversy a title like that. That title was clearly designed to gain attention for a thesis that otherwise would not have been noticed. Throughout this saga, you know, there have been people who've said, well, it's a very confronting title and all you're trying to do is, is get people to read it and to get attention. And my reaction to that was, well, yeah, I want people to read it. I, 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 want, I don't want it to sit in the library amongst 3,000 other theses and, and not be read. I want people to grab it and go, wow, this is interesting. What's this about? It's an important topic. I won't say I'm an expert with disabled people, but I have worked with them, and my son is a social worker who works with them, and I know that these people struggle with enormous issues. They struggle with acceptance, they struggle with sexuality, they struggle with just simply being part of our community, and I believe Australia still has a long way to go. Now, whether their plight can be relieved by comedy, I don't know. I suspect not. It feel really happy inside and really, really good. It not feel like um, I, I like as not feel like small. I feel really proud and what I'm doing and what I've done. And oh, it's so happy when we be on t on on a t on TV. Comedy and disability is not anything new like it's not um, I'm not the first to to explore this area but what I think's great about the work that I'm doing is that it's actually featuring two guys who have disabilities they're not actors um, they're real and to me that is the most pure voice you can have I reckon I'm funny because I'm funny I don't know how but I'm funny I cannot say any more about that because if I'm funny, I'm funny. If people not funny, they suck all. They suck. I don't know. I like to be a comedian because I like to do funny stuff, tell jokes. Yeah. I like to tell jokes and everything. <laughs> 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 They're funny. Darren and James come across as some grotesque, caricatured, cartoon character. They are presented to appear buffoon-like. They are stooges for our amusement. From my reading of descriptions of this project, the participants in fact didn't understand the humour. It's just cheap laughs at the expense of people who don't have social skills to read between the lines of what makes people laugh. When I'm on a screen and people laughing, that makes me feel happy because I... I think in my mind that they love the movie and they Come on. And I like I like to make everyone laugh. Yeah, because I like doing funny things. Yeah. And I like entertaining people. Darren and James are unable to share in the humour. They have specific impairments in their capacity to comprehend and regardless of whether the disabled people in the film agreed or not, they are intellectually disabled. That means they don't understand the ramifications of what they are doing. The setup for the humour was to laugh at their doomed attempts to engage with people while oblivious to the fact that they were making themselves look stupid. Excellent and I'm really happy about it and oh it I don't know, it turned my, turn my, um, turn me around, like. I doubt whether the standard of this production, where two men are taken off in a, you know, a noddy car, are presented in a pub in Bulga, are groped by an Aboriginal woman, 
are using an enlarged pencil. Now, I haven't seen this. This is what I've heard. It doesn't sound like it is actually enhancing the role and the plight of disabled people. We had a little car called Darren and Jane on it. And it's really funny. It got lots of UFO and Yari and Kankaroo and Down Under. And oh, it's really funny. It looked like Mr. Bean's car, but. Bit bigger. I certainly don't think that having two young disabled men running around interviewing people with a giant pencil or riding a noddy car can be interpreted in any way as portraying them in a respectful or even humorously respectful way. I find way. it hard to believe that the brightly coloured car, which is the size of my foot, would be the best mode of transport across the outback. Could it have been a setup? Looks like it looked like it was a bit of a clown pencil. Like, like a bit funny, funny pencil. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I, I like using the pencil because the pencil made people laugh. <laughs> I wouldn't do it, that if you wrecked it. Make one, make one laugh. <laughs> yeah, make people laugh, their heads off. Excellent. I cannot wait to go in it again. It's a question of, of a full understanding and full comprehension of the situation in which they are in. And clearly in this particular situation, they did not have full comprehension of, of, of all the details at all. Darren and James are not married to lawyers or film producers, or indeed to anyone. They are human beings with intellectual disabilities. They do not work or run a business. They do not give interviews or issue press releases simply because they can't. Hookham and McLennan refer to Darren and James as incompetent, incapable people who who can't really function as human beings. They've never met them. Um, to this day, they've not met them. And if they did, they'd see that Darren and James are actually very independent, free-thinking men. They run a household, they have jobs, they go to the pub, they enjoy their lives, they, they have life ambitions like we all do, and everything that Hooker and McLennan have written about them you know, has this, it makes this assumption that they're completely in, incapable of, of grasping anything or understanding anything in the world. And that's just, you know, that's offensive. We're not, we're not dumb or got men do thing. If they're going to be in my shoe and, and we talk about them, I bet it they're not happy about that. I, I can, I'm, a, I'm an adult now, I can do, it, I can do whatever I want. I can go, if I'm at the pub, I can go to the pub. No one's stopping me. I can do it at the pub if I want to. The slogan that, you know, I often talk about is, uh, nothing about us without us and that has really come out of the lived experience of people with disability of being you know written about um, talked about you know in lots and lots of different areas of life and so people with disability have said like enough of that we actually have things to say about our own life and it's quite different from the the non-disability story and if you want to write or um, produce material about this, we want to be consulted about the things that are essential to our own lives. There's a saying out there, and I've heard people say it, it's nothing about us without us. And um, I can remember talking to Darren about that, and he said, well, I don't want to be part of the disability club. They don't represent me. And I think people have got to be aware of that. Whatever I can do to stand up for the powerless, I will do. For that is the meaning I choose to give to my life. We have a duty to advocate for the disabled. We have defended two young men unable to defend themselves. While some people might need some assistance, I'm not saying they don't, um, there's a hell of a lot of people with, with disabilities that don't need protecting. They don't need people to go and speak for them. They're quite capable of speaking for themselves. A university thesis about two disabled men sparked an outcry this week as academics who panned it were suspended. They were found to have breached QUT's code of conduct and suspended for six months without pay. Dissenting dogs out in the cold. Queensland Uni suspends two academics. Gary McLennan and John Hooker were found guilty by a three-person misconduct investigation committee. Unanimous judgment. Academics stunned at six-month ban. Late Friday afternoon, they were suspended, had their work emails disconnected and were barred from the university premises. What truly hurts is that we have failed to rescue the two young disabled men from QUT. Noonan will be more convinced than ever that the path to glory and money lies through the vilification of disabled. Seemingly, no one can stop them. Hey!
The suspension sparked angry protests from university students and people with disabilities who labelled the punishment extreme. Students rally to support suspended academics. 100 students and staff rally to protest the suspension of two QUT academics. Overturn this penalty. McClellan and Hookham should be reinstated immediately. These brave defenders of the disabled should be rewarded, not punished. An incredibly draconian overreaction. We should all go to look what's happened to us. Look, I mean, what message is QUT giving to other academics? Speak up and you'll be, I mean, you'll be smacked down. That's the message here. Uni disables a basic freedom. QUT threatens free speech. QUT free speech protests. QUT has attacked free speech. It is at war with the disability community. All speakers should anticipate arrest. disturbed about what is happening to them and I am disturbed about what is happening to their rights for free speech. He is being um, persecuted by the university for expressing his free, free, freely expressing um, his beliefs, which is something that he always encourages students to do. I think really the issue here is that Gary and John are being castigated because they went public, they went to the media. I went to a bar and, and a student came up to me, a protester, and he said, uh, you know, what's next? You know, who are you going to laugh at next? And threw his entire drink over me. As I was leaving, there was a group of protesters um, hanging around and, and, and they started yelling at me. And, and, and as I'm getting in my car, they're, they're like, shame and don't laugh at disability and shame on you, shame on you. And, and, and what, it was like crazy. Thank you very much, guys. That, that was amazing. Thank you very, very much. Suspended lecturers to launch legal action. Uni suspensions headed for court. Two academics suspended for six months are taking their row with the university to the Supreme Court. Lawyer Steve Caron of Caron & Co Lawyers said yesterday he would apply for a judicial review of QUT's handling of the cases. Dr Gary McLennan and John Hookham are now taking legal action against the university over their suspensions. Their wages have been reinstated pending a hearing later this year. Challenge to uni. Academics ask for whistleblower rights. Two academics have applied to be protected as whistleblowers. Lecturers battle on. New hearing into film round. Two academics have taken their case to the Human Rights and Equal Opportunities Committee. The Commission last week accepted a complaint of discrimination on the basis of political opinion. Dr John Hookham and Dr Gary McLennan also have complained about Queensland University of Technology to the National Health and Medical Research Council. The NHMRC has the power to suspend research funding and have an institution named and shamed in federal parliament. They were now trying to find every possible angle to make the project look bad. And if they could do that, if they could find somebody to, to stop the project or to intervene, then maybe they could excuse their own behaviour. What I would like now is for everyone to concentrate on the campaign to save the young disabled men from QUT. One of the foci of the campaign is to get the adult guardian to intervene to rescue the young men. She has the power to do it, but seemingly will only act under pressure. We are asking all concerned for the rights of the disabled to write to the adult guardian to ask her to intervene. It got to the stage where this campaign hit such a low that they contacted the adult guardian. And that was really offensive and, and really disturbing because Darren and James are adults, you know. Darren's 41 and James is 21 and, and they can make decisions for themselves. And if Darren and James need support, they need assistance in any part of their lives, then their parents and their loved ones are there for them. I felt really sorry for the parents and Darren and James themselves. I just thought this was just so low, such a low act. What I'd like to know is if the parents of the two disabled people have seen the tape, do they know that their sons are being laughed at? If so, then they, do they approve of it? Should the um, adult guardian, a government appointed person, not intervene and challenge their guardianship? Ever since I can remember, people have offered advice for James on what he should do and how I should raise him, or Adrian, should, Adrian, Adrian and I should raise him. They've told us what they thought our son was like without ever consulting our opinions about what we felt about our son, our son. There were times where I used to stand there listening to people say to me these, offering advice about my son and telling me about my son. I used to stand and think, you're all telling lies because this is not my son. I know my son. As James's father, uh, I was rather 
um, disturbed, I suppose, to read about the events that uh, transpired and the controversy that, that appeared in the media. If I was uh, had any concerns that James was being taken advantage of and being made the subject of ridicule, I wouldn't have him uh, being involved in it. But I'm totally satisfied that uh, that my son is not being taken advantage of, nor Darren, from what I can see. He's able to make his own decisions about what he would like to do and what he's comfortable with. And the parents and guardians who gave permission for this horror show, in the US they would be immediately stripped of any rights to care for the individual. They clearly lack any ability to protect them from those who seek to exploit and harm them. James's mum needs to ask herself if you're not exploiting her son's needs when you sent James up to the Bully pub carrying his horse head pencil to find a girl. Well, as a mother, it's been a struggle since, since the day he was born, really, in terms of trying to fight for his rights. Um, it took us a number of years to get some diagnosis to what was wrong. I had parents uh, alienating, alienated from me. I'd just moved to Brisbane. Um, your first source of contact of, of social friends is through parents. That didn't happen for me. I was segregated from the rest of the parents. They wouldn't uh, have anything to do with me. One lady rang me up and told me to get him out of the school, that she was going to actually play, a, she was going to video my son's behaviour and send it to us. She told me to get him out of the school, that we belonged in, a, in an Arla area where people with dysfunctional backgrounds belonged and that's where we should be. Um, they had a PNC meeting at the school uh, without Adrian and I, without our consent about our son, about getting him out of the school. It was discussed, the, the headmaster told me some weeks later about this meeting. He didn't seem to think he had any obligation to me to even consult me about this meeting that was about to take place, that we should be present to protect our son. They, they just didn't care. We were not supported by the community. We were alienated. Some years later, I was walking down the street in my local neighbourhood and um, this woman was, had a dog with her and I was admiring her dog. And she said, I remember you. I said, oh, I didn't remember who she was. And she said to me, uh, I remember you from the school. She said, yes, I remember the time, the hard time everybody gave you. She said, you know, there was a group of us there that were batting for you. And I said, well, why are you telling me now, five years later? Why didn't you tell me then when I needed somebody? She said, she said oh, we were really upset about the whole community just alienating you because of your son. <laughs> no use to be five years, six years later. If I felt that James, as suggested, was being exploited by Michael Noonan and the Spectrum organisation with this filming, I would know. Instinctively, I would know because I've always been a protector as a mother of James. Uh, I, I, I have instinctively would know if he was unhappy or he felt he was being pushed into it or he was felt he was being made to do something he didn't want to know, want to do. I would know. I have never felt that. I have felt joy and happiness for him that he is doing something that really, really what he wants to do. He feels involved with, and he feels that he's contributing to, and. Every time I think of Spectrum Organisation and my, Michael Noonan and the film crew, I, I, I feel uh, joyous, I feel relieved that these people have come along and, and, and recognise the value in my son that I've always known has been there. And once again, there are people in the world making judgments, telling people, telling us, telling uh, uh, people involved what they should do with people with disabilities and, 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 and making presumptions uh, about what my son wants to do. They just won't, I wish they'd just leave him alone. I've seen lots of the footage. I've seen the situations that, uh, that occur in different places, in uh, outback towns. And uh, I've seen James um, exercising his humorous side in, in dealing with some of that. James seems quite comfortable and uh, both his mother and I are are very comfortable with the whole procedure. All this travelling around Australia has uh, done wonders for James. He's a different person. He's happy. He's, uh, he, he has a, a group of people that he feels he belongs to, who he refers to, who he texts to, he goes around to barbecues to. He, he, he has a peer group. He's got, a, he's got a life. He's got a life that he's always wanted. The fact that um, the two persons and their families did give their approval to the film I don't think that justifies making it because, yeah, those families took the decision on behalf of all the disabled in, 
in all of Australia and all over the world. This doesn't just um, it doesn't just uh, affect uh, those two persons personally. It affects everyone. I can't wait to be on TV then. Everyone going to notice us and then the people not going to leave us alone, they'd say. Hey, look, they're doing no Jane, right? Uh, when Jones turned 18, we wanted to give him a party. Um, and once again, it was a problem because there wasn't a peer group that we could invite along to a party. All the other children had his siblings that had parties and we had big 18th do's. And now this year, James turns 21. Thank you. Thanks so much to the Spectrum organisation and the film crew, Michael Noonan and his film crew. We now have a gang of people that we can invite along who like James just for himself, as for James, as the person he is, who see themselves as part of his life as much as he sees himself as part of their life. That has just been the most wonderful, comforting feeling for Adrian and I. Um, I'm already planning the party uh, to think that I have a number of people to invite. And it, he just beams when I talk about the 21st and inviting everybody along. So it's just made such a difference to his life. If QUT wanted to defend their ethical standards, they should be willing to show this film to all of us. We should be able to see it and comment on it. But I would like to see the footage. If it's OK, then why isn't the university prepared to let it run? There should be that chance to say, no, that is wrong. No, that is not what we want to happen. Look, I can't comment on the footage that Mike Noonan showed because I haven't seen it and I haven't been able to get a copy of it. If it is OK, why isn't it being shown freely and publicly to all of us who have an interest in this topic? Yeah. It's an important topic. The controversy has been intense, but Michael Noonan won't show the video that's at the centre of it all. Thank you. Thank you. That's an honour. Thank you. Your parents have seen it, the two men themselves have seen it, and, and they all love it and they're all very supportive. And, uh, you know, I think I don't think there's anything wrong with the footage. I think it's, it's going to be a great show. I'm really, I feel really strongly about then it. Then why don't you want people to see it? I think um, it's unfinished. Why are you so reluctant to show it again? Show the tape and prove the disability community wrong. This material is so bad, it can never be shown. It violates the ethical norms for filming people of impaired capacity. Not showing us the footage suggests there's a lot of truth in the hearsay and you are afraid the footage will prove us wrong. Show the tape or admit the truth of the allegation against you. Eventually this tape will see the light of day. Eventually someone will have the courage to ask why this monstrous project is possible. When that happens, my reaction will be just tape is essential to our defence and it constitutes material evidence of the abuse of men with impaired capacity. Film full of fuss goes online. Queenslanders can now judge for themselves the merits of controversial film footage, which sparked one of the biggest rows ever in Australian academia. Harmless subject matter caught up in university politics. The work at the heart of the row appears innocuous. While Noonan admits he set out to be provocative, it is just as clear that his intentions in relation to James Bradley and Darren McGee are entirely honourable. It is certainly not offensive. Good on you, Michael Noonan. Congratulations on the project, Michael. I have two sons with Asperger's syndrome. I applaud Michael Noonan showing people who are a bit different in such a positive light. I applaud Michael for his bravery to not only support these two young funny fellows, but for daring to explore a sensitive subject with a genuine heart. I am a teacher of children with disabilities. I found the clips wonderful. The two men, Darren and James, were charming and disarming. There is nothing at all in this footage to suggest Noonan has taken advantage of the two disabled. I hope Michael and Darren and James see much success. Brilliant job. May QUT continue to support such important work. Well, Governor McClendon have misrepresented your work. I'm not ashamed to say that I laughed at some of the things that Darren and James had to say. Disabled or not, they are both capable of being funny. Australian Catholic Disability Council. Five members of the ACBC all agree that the project has the potential to advance greater understanding and increase inclusivity of people living with a disability. There's an awful lot of people out there who owe Michael Noonan and QUT an apology. The simple reality is that a good man working on a good project was falsely demonised. 
National Health and Medical Research Council. I am satisfied that QUT has acted appropriately and is able to justify both the ethical review process and the subsequent review that took place. University Human Research Ethics The Committee. audit panel found no misconduct, no evidence of harm, discomfort, ridicule or exploitation to the participants, Darren and James. The panel noted the positive enthusiasm of the participants involved, their treatment with dignity and sensitivity, and the warm way in which they were welcomed into the particular community where the film had occurred. And for some reason or I said out loud to the universe, I will never sell out. I just kind of, I don't know, I was sober even at the time. <laughs> and um, I said that. Disability Row academics take money and walk. QUT settles dispute with lecturers. And that's my advice to, of course, be careful, be cautious. But do not sell out. Do not betray your hearts. Suspended academics quit. Under a confidential deed, the pair have voluntarily resigned from QUT after winning reported $200,000 payouts. You know, I was completely relieved. You know, it felt to me that finally it was over. Um, they came into the university and uh, collected their things and left and, and, and they were gone. Nothing you can do to me today or in the future will stop me from continuing to speak out for the powerless. Nothing, absolutely nothing. I cannot be silenced. You know, they talk about how they'll never sell out and how they'll uh, stay there and fight for the rights of people with disabilities. And yet, in the end, they took a payout and left. They walked away. They walked away with cash. So what happens now? What happens to all those people that they're so-called out there trying to protect? They didn't need protecting in the first place. If people want to watch it, people watch it and, and sit back and laugh about it and jog and go, oh, God, how funny, that a good, good movie, I want to watch it again. And then, then we go going to make more movie and more movie and maybe, maybe one or two or three movie, like um, part one, part two, part three, or down under, out in space, or... Sorry, like that. What, what mystery next? Um, let's just drive in and see what happens. Okay.